the vast majority of toothpastes contain titanium dioxide because it gives them their white color. But in recent years, this substance suddenly became a suspect in causing cancer. And I have bad news, toothpastes are not the only usage. Titanium dioxide is also commonly used in food, labeled as additive E171. We all consumed some candy with that ingredient at one point or another, at least until August 2022. That's when the European Union banned its usage in edible products because it was no longer considered safe for consumption. The FDA doesn't share this opinion and still considers it safe. And it is still used in toothpaste all around the world. So what does that mean for us? Are we all going to develop cancer now? Why did nobody test titanium dioxide before they put it in our food? And how do we even test whether something is safe or not? To date, over 500 substances are either definitely or possibly causing cancer. We call them carcinogens. They either damage our DNA or promote abnormal cell growth. This is bad because it can help already existing cancer cells to grow. But even if there aren't any bad cells right now, the more cells grow, the higher the chance that a mutation happens. Sometimes it becomes obvious in hindsight that a substance is a carcinogen. Take smoking as an example. The rate of lung cancer was much higher in smokers than in non-smokers. So some smart people made the connection and concluded that smoking is the reason. But it's not always that easy to figure out. After all, we consume a lot of things and it's hard to know which of the ingredients might be the reason why people develop cancer. The sheer amount is also the reason we can't test every single substance we might possibly eat or put onto our bodies. When it comes to titanium dioxide, it is considered to be possibly carcinogenic. In certain amounts and when it's really tiny. We're talking nanoparticles here. A billionth of a meter. That's the case in food production, but not in toothpaste. So it was banned in one, but not the other. But please keep in mind that even if something is a carcinogen, it does not mean that everybody who ever came in contact is going to develop cancer for sure. It depends on different factors like genetic predisposition and how long and how intense the exposure was. But how do we test whether something is safe or not? We can't just take a bunch of humans and expose them to a possible carcinogen to figure out which ones are harmful. And ideally, we want to know that something is dangerous before people develop cancer. Hindsight is good, but prevention is better. Let's look at the five most commonly used techniques to identify health hazards. The first one are epidemiological studies, where scientists look at a population and their cancer rates. Not only whether they get sick or not, but also what type of cancer people are getting. By doing this, they try to figure out if there is a connection between cancer rates and exposure to certain substances. For example, in the first half of the 20th century, researchers observed higher rates of lung cancer and another rare type of cancer among workers in mining and construction. These observations raised suspicions about asbestos being a carcinogen, which was later confirmed with other studies. Even though this is a mix of hindsight and prevention, I still wanted to mention it because of its importance. After all, now everybody knows that smoking and asbestos are bad and we can avoid these things. Another way to do testing are animal studies. It is what the name suggests, animals get exposed to substances and scientists observe them over a period of time to see whether they develop tumors or other cancer-related effects such as abnormal cell growth. The third method are in vitro studies. These are experiments done in a lab. Cell cultures or tissues get exposed to the substance in question, so researchers can look at factors such as cell growth, cell death, DNA damage and changes in gene expression. Gene expression is like following a recipe, it's the process where instructions in your DNA are read and used to make proteins and other molecules that your body needs to function. If any of the mentioned things happen, scientists know that this substance is bad. This method has many benefits, for one, it's a controlled environment, meaning that the likelihood of something else contributing to the changes that are observed is very small. On top of that, this method can be done without animal testing, it is cheaper and can be done in a shorter time frame. So why isn't this method used exclusively then? Because unfortunately, the results don't always translate to a whole human being. In real life, our immune system and other factors come into play and the outcome might be different than in the lab. Because of that, this method is used in addition to other tests. Don't run away when you hear the name of the next method. It is called Structure Activity Relationship Analysis. I know this sounds very sophisticated, but actually it isn't. Let me explain. Each chemical has its own shape and structure, just like pieces of a puzzle, and we know what the shape of already identified harmful chemicals look like. When we want to know if a substance is harmful, its shape and structure are compared to those of harmful ones. If it's similar, it's very likely that it's not good for us. 
On the flip side, this can even help scientists to design safer chemicals because they know what to avoid. And the fifth method are genotoxicity tests. There are a variety of tests that can be done here, but the main goal of them all is to check whether a substance can cause damage to our DNA. The Ames test is the most commonly used one in this category. Researchers take some bacteria like Salmonella and do some cool sciencey stuff to make them sensitive to DNA damage. These bacteria carry mutations that prevent them from producing nutrients that are important for their growth. So basically, it's expected that they stay the same. Then they get exposed to the substance that needs to be tested, and if the substance causes any changes to the DNA, the Salmonella might regain their ability to grow and will form colonies. Then we know to better avoid that specific substance. If you enjoyed this video and want to help me form my own colony here on YouTube, leave a like and a subscribe.